Good afternoon, everyone. Bon après-midi, tout le monde. Be Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for... Welcome. My name is Jean Lebel. I'm the president of the International Development Research Center, and it's a pleasure to welcome you, to offer you a very warm welcome uh, to all of you for joining us this afternoon. And I want to welcome also everyone that is listening to us through the webcast and pay a special attention attention to our colleagues that are members of the diplomatic corp as well as official from the Canadian government so all welcome um, pour ceux qui, uh, for those of you who need uh, simultaneous interpretation we have French and English services so you have headsets set at the back over there. English is on channel one, French on channel two, and if you need some uh, supplemental power in your ears, uh, the floor is channel three. Let me tell you that I'm quite proud, and IDRC is proud to host uh, this celebration of the 10th anniversary of the First African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, also known as AIMS. As you, some of you may know, the first AIMS Center was established in 2003 in Cape Town, South Africa. And there are now five AIMS Centers, the one in South Africa, one in Senegal, one in Ghana, one in Cameroon that was recently launched last month, and one that will be launched in the near term in Tanzania. IDRC provides funding and administers the Canadian government major contribution to AIMS. This was a pledge of Canadian government of $20 million that has already been growing with support from the United Kingdom Department for International Development as well as the Bosch Foundation in Germany. So it's not only about the Canadian money and being at the right place at the right time, it's also having people that use it in order to lever the resource of others and make the pie larger for accomplishing the work that will be described to you today. And today, you will hear from a remarkable set of young people, the AIMS alumni, young people that have been trained in mathematical through the AIMS program. And I'm going to introduce them first because I think they are the one that behind the scene makes AIMS happen, that has made it for over 500 students from Africa up to now, and the hopes, and I don't think it's only the hope. I think it will be the continent that will provide the next Einstein. And let me use the plural in Einstein. I think that there is many to come, both male and female. So we have Martial Defo from Cameroon. Martial, welcome. Marvelous Onuma Kalu from Nigeria. Welcome, Marvelous. Nozifiwo Wane from Swaziland. Richard Junganiko Muntali from Malawi, as well as Felix, oh, Felix Ogene Kowo from Nigeria. Did I pronounce it well? <laughs> Welcome to all of you. <laughs> AIM has many champions, and among them is Excellency, the Governor General of Canada, Mr. David Johnson, who was last night at the reception with us to celebrate AIMS and spoke of its importance. Um, last spring, I had the privilege to be on a state visit with His Excellency and numbers of colleagues, and whether it was in Ghana, Botswana, or South Africa, in every public speaking opportunity he had, he spoke of AIMS and its accomplishment and of the leadership of his uh, thinker. And yesterday, he brought again the same message, and he underlined, I think, very vividly the exceptional leadership of Neil Turok here, Thierry Zomahun, as well as all the students from the Ames Initiative. As you can see, we have quite a crowded stage. It's probably the most crowded stage I've seen in years at IDRC. And, you know, the next step for me is to fall beside the podium. <laughs> so. I will make a few introductions, and I'm going to, you know, introduce to you first Neil, Neil Turok. Neil Turok is the man who conceived the idea of AIMS and made it happen. Then sitting right on his right hand side is uh, the executive director of AIMS, Thierry uh, Zomahoun. Que je en français. That I should introduce in French, Thierry. We have the pleasure and the exceptional privilege of having an exceptional moderator, Mr. Paul Wells. Paul's welcome, and as you know, he is a political commentator, author, and columnist for McLean Magazine, and probably one of the most read and listened to commentator in Canada on Canadian politics. 
A little bit more detail about Neil. Uh, Canadian may know him best as the director of the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics based in Waterloo, Ontario. The Perimeter Institute was created some years ago through an endowment from Mark Lazaritis, who was one of the founders of the BlackBerry device research in motion. Uh, in 2012, he delivered the CBC Massey Lectures across this country with passion and inspiration under the title The Universe Within. Massey Lecture created 61, 62. Numbers of Tinker have been providing public speeches on matter of importance, whether it's science, philosophy, politics, uh, technology. And I think that, Neil, you did a fantastic job. I think the recording is still available on CBC website. I encourage you to listen to it. He was born in South Africa. Africa during difficult years, he made his way through and reached the highest ground with his academic career, a career that has taken him to professorships at Princeton, Cambridge, working with someone that you may know that is highly seen in the world of physics, Stephen Hawking. And now he's at the Perimeter Institute, as I was saying. His many honors and awards include the 2008 TED Prize for Innovation, which he used to help expand aims across Africa. As you can see, Neil is not afraid of big challenges. In fact, I have not mentioned, but in his regular work day, he is also a theoretical physicist. And because he's not afraid of big challenges, he chooses to specialize in the study of the universe. So, you know, you have it all there. <laughs> Neil, welcome. Uh, Thierry, Thierry uh, uh, is the executive director of AIMS. He, the last 20 years of his life, was given to development in Africa, in uh, Latin America, in the Caribbean. The development of uh, small and medium enterprises are part of his mandate. He is well known in all the world for his very important, exceptional work in educational programs. Everywhere in the world, he plays different roles in different agencies and consultation firms. And something I did not know before meeting him, he has three master's degrees, including one in, uh, he has an MBA from McGill University. Thierry has, is a very dynamic, he has a lot of energy was in uh, South Africa, he found, you know, half an hour to meet with me with and the member of parliament, Peter Braid of Waterloo, that is a very strong supporter of Ames. And uh, he was literally flying to the airport to catch a flight to go to Berlin in order to meet with representative of the Bosch Foundation. Uh, minutes ago, I was with Thierry in my office and he said, Jean, we really need to finish at five. I have a flight for <laughs> Germany right after the presentation. <laughs> So welcome, Thierry. And finally, Paul. Paul Wells, senior columnist for McLean's Magazine. As I mentioned, he's one of Canada's leading political commentator and covers Ottawa in his blog that you should read, and that is very well named, Inclus Wells. He served for uh, the McLean's, I think, in Paris as a correspondent. You've probably have read some of very good writing about Germany, Poland, UK, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. I've heard that you never traveled to Africa, but I think you have a good excuse in visiting some of the AIMS Center in the near future. We should think of this. I'll, I'll find a way. Paul has just published a book called The Longer I'm Prime Minister, which I am told is a must-read for political observer on all sides of the aisles. I haven't read it yet. And before I end things over to Neil, Thierry, and Paul as a moderator, we're going to get started with a short video that I had the privilege to see yesterday, and that tells the story from within with the best people to tell the story, the Ames student alumni that have been through the difficulty of, you know, getting a degree, but with the reward also of contributing to the development of their continent, development of business in their continent, thinking and solving problems that others might be facing in other parts of the world. So all, I wish you a very pleasant afternoon. Merci beaucoup. Thank you to all of you. Okay, well, welcome to everybody. Thank you so much to, for coming to this event. Um, I came here shortly after I came to Canada in 2009 and gave a talk about Ames and my uh, 
laptop ran out of battery halfway through the talk. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's what I remember. But that was the beginning of a sort of campaign to try to interest uh, Canada and the IDRC in particular in uh, becoming a part of this uh, AIMS project. So let me say a little bit about AIMS. <clears throat> I was uh, extremely fortunate to be, uh, to be able to start uh, the AIMS project. Uh, we started in 2001. We had no money. Uh, we simply had an idea. Uh, my father, who's a, a well-known politician in South Africa, in fact, is chair of the ethics committee in the parliament. You may see him online. He's always in trouble for investigating <laughs> ministers on uh, corruption charges. But uh, my father really challenged me to do this, uh, identified a building. Uh, we bought an old derelict building in Musenberg the town which you see in that video, the seaside town. So we were able to buy a very old uh, derelict building for $100,000. It's a 80-bedroom hotel. It's a beautiful old uh, building. And we worked to raise the money and convert the building into a state-of-the-art training center for mathematical science. And uh, so why did we do this? Um, I think it was through a very profound belief in the enormous untapped potential in Africa, uh, untapped potential of young people. And it's young people who are going to drive the future of the continent. And I have to say, this has really been like a discovery. Uh, we have discovered a wellspring of talent, of passion, of commitment, uh, which even we didn't expect it. Uh, I was having a conversation last night with one of our alumni from uh, Congo Brazzaville, who's studying in Ottawa. And I just let him talk. And he told me, he's a mathematician. I mean, he's a very serious scientist, OK, a technical guy. But after talking for a while, he began to say, this is really an emotional issue. Uh, he represents the entry of his people into advanced science and technology. And that is profoundly symbolic. Uh, it represents the coming of age of Africa. It represents the future of Africa. And actually, it represents the future of the planet. Because Africa has the fastest growing population in the world. Uh, its youthful population is the only continent still growing in the world. It will double over the next 30 years. And uh, so that um, three decades from now, uh, Africans will comprise one third of the young people in, in, on the world, the people under 25. There will be a wave of Africans, I confidently predict. Uh, Ames is part of that. Ames is riding this wave. Uh, it's inevitable anyway, but Ames is helping to uh, create the momentum of the wave, and we're surfing on the wave. You saw the waves there. Every time we look at the sea in Musenberg, that's what I think of. I think of the wave that's coming of brilliant young Africans who are going to transform the continent and do amazing things for the world. Now, why is Africa going to do amazing things? Because Africa is the most diverse continent on the planet, 300 languages. So many cultures, so many perspectives. Africa represents enormous diversity. And within the Ames classroom, that diversity is a very powerful force uh, because you bring all these uh, very intelligent young people together with uh, the best lecturers in the world who are willing to go and teach them because it's such an exciting experience to be part of the transformation of a continent. So they have great lecturers, and then you have all this diversity in one classroom. And, and you know what happens? People realize there's something bigger than all of us, okay? uh, which is the universe. Okay? Uh, and it's not just the universe. It's the fact we can understand it. We have, for some reason we don't understand, human beings have a capacity to understand the universe. And this is, in fact, the driving force behind progress of human society. I mean, you, you look around you, you see the buildings, the roads, the cities. They could not have been designed without Pythagoras' rule. 
And Pythagoras' rule was discovered by someone inspired by the heavens and by music, actually, to understand mathematics and geometry. And, and this tradition of understanding the universe through deep mathematical principles runs through the Renaissance with Galileo and Newton, and then the discovery of Maxwell's equations, electricity, magnetism, and Einstein, E equals MC squared, and relativity. And these discoveries have paved the way, and quantum theory, which uh, just today I was speaking to a journalist about innovation, okay, which is the latest buzzword. And I said, well, do you know where the transistor came from? And of course she didn't. And it comes from quantum mechanics. It comes from the understanding of the electron. It comes from the most basic uh, knowledge and the most powerful and the most reliable knowledge we have, which is uh, mathematics and physics and our deepest understanding of nature. So um, without the transistor, we would have no computers. We would have no internet. We would have no smartphones, no electronics. But you know, the exciting thing is this is not the end. This stuff in 20, 30 years' time, we'll be laughing at our smartphones. Okay, because we will have quantum electronics. We'll have quantum computers. Uh, by the way, that's what Marvelous <laughs> works on. That's why she's nodding. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and, and so there is a great future happening. Now, what happened with, with Ames is through my own uh, being inspired by my own parents, by the struggle against apartheid, my own experience teaching in a school in Lesotho between uh, high school and university, I realized there, there's talent in Africa. And Africa needs it. It needs it for development. But somehow developing this talent will be an amazing thing to see because it will do more than almost anything else to undermine stereotypes. You know, you think Africans are lazy? <laughs> People claim that. You know, spend some time at Ames. <laughs> you will see students working till 3, 4 a.m. in the computer lab every, every evening, up again at 8.30. Such enthusiasm, such motivation. You, you may think they need help today. Well, just watch out tomorrow because uh, your job might be at risk, <laughs> okay? And this is the, <clears throat> the best answer to any form of um, prejudice, is to give people the opportunity to show what they can do. And, and, and Ames has just way exceeded what anyone expected. And as I say, it's the beginning of this wave, which I believe actually will transform science, because the entry of new cultures into science is profoundly stimulating. Uh, when new cultures come in, they tend to question everything, uh, reject what uh, the, the status quo is, and come up with better ways. A great example is when young Jews entered science. And people tend to be a little afraid to talk about this because maybe it, it might be racist or something, but it's, it's true. When young Jews had access to advanced education and became scientists at the end of the 19th century. And by the way, they were excluded from university before then, before the middle of the 19th century, they were excluded. When they came in, what happened? You had brilliant mathematicians, brilliant physicists. And so the 20th century is, uh, the Jewish scientists played a massive role uh, from Einstein, Bohr, um, many, many others, Pauli, many, many others played a huge role. And that's what really what we're looking at. If we look at the world today, there's 7 billion people on the planet. Most of them do not have access yeah. to good education. Uh, they, they're gaining access to the internet, which is a huge uh, bonus, a huge plus. When these young people get access to great training, great opportunities, they're going to change everything. Um, so I think we, AIMS is something the whole world can draw huge optimism from. And I think one of the things we are most thrilled about when we launch the next Einstein, you know, we, we, we launch the slogan that we want the next Einstein to be African. I was a little nervous because I'm a theoretical physicist and, and, and you don't take Einstein's name lightly. <laughs> so before I launched that slogan, 
I called all my most critical friends, Nobel Prize winners and so on. I said, I'm going to make this wish that the next Einstein, what do you think? And to my amazement, these super critical people said, yes, of course. We need Africa. We know that. People know what Africa's done for music. Where would music be without Africa? Nowhere. Okay. Uh, art, literature, people know Africa is an endless source of creativity. Uh, it's not entered science yet. What's going to happen? Uh, one of my friends, uh, Jim Gates, says it'll be like when, when jazz began. When blues came into music and jazz, I mean, jazz is the most creative, spontaneous, incredible form of music. And one has to conceive of that happening when Africa enters high-level science. Um, so, uh, so it's it, it's been an amazing privilege to be part of Ames. Um, we are gaining unbelievable support across Africa. So, not only the science community reacted positively, but within Africa, this is what presidents get. You say, "Ah, we're trying to make the next Einstein." <laughs> and we believe it can be one of your young people. They immediately get the message. We have huge support. And as I say, I, I mean, we've been so fortunate to recruit Thierry, our uh, executive director. <clears throat> Thierry himself is, uh, is an example of this new wave. He's the predecessor, right, the forerunner <clears throat> of the new wave. Uh, from extremely underprivileged background. He was a street kid for five years. F made his way through, he's trained in theology, which makes him uh, the best people uh, pastor, the best people manager you can imagine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, then he came to Canada, he did a master's in journalism, came to Canada, did the MBA at McGill, uh, we were so fortunate to, to, to meet Thierry and set him this almost impossible task, right, of creating 15 centers like the one in South Africa, all over Africa. And Thierry has risen to the challenge more than we imagined. Uh, in fact, here are some of our alumni walking in. <laughs> the last fellow is the one who, <laughs> uh, who said uh, this is an emotional thing. <laughs> Uh, his name is Lord, by the way, um, and, um, and he's from Brazzaville. So we have this, uh, we, we believe we've hit, tapped into a wellspring of talent. Uh, we've tapped into uh, uh, incredible support within Africa, outside Africa, within the scientific community. Um, the sky's the limit right now uh, for Ames. And it's been a huge privilege working with IDRC. I must say, one can't imagine better program managers uh, who understand all the growing pains of a new organization. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion. So uh, thank you very much. Thierry, Thierry. tell us more. Thank you very much. Um, my story with uh, with Ames is a very emotional one, <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to acknowledge your presence here. Thanks for coming. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jean Lebel, the IDRC leadership, uh, your team uh, uh, for putting this together. Uh, the past couple of days have been has been uh, a very exciting day. Uh, two days, uh, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. I will report to my entire team about what we've done in Canada for these two days. I was saying that my story with uh, Ames uh, is a very emotional one, but it's also uh, a story, the story of a dream, a personal dream coming true. I was sitting um, four years ago in my chief executive officers in downtown Toronto for a microfinance organization. Uh, I was happy. I had a good salary. I had a good life in, in Canada. I just bought a, my first house. But I was bored. <laughs> <laughs> I was bored. I was looking out of the, my window in my office. And one question I asked myself, what are you doing here? It has nothing to do with Canada. It's the job I'm in. 
because my organization has no program in Africa. I try to tell my board, you know, I need one tiny project in Africa, and I don't need you to provide money for it. I will go everywhere to get money for it. They said, yeah, you know, for 30 years we've been in Latin America, Africa, yeah, you know, many people are already in Africa. So I, I tried for more than a year. I, I wasn't successful. So I said to my wife, you know, <laughs> I've been. I've spent more than two decades in development. I've seen it all, humbly speaking. You know, microfinance, human capital development, training, education, from uh, the from one end to the other end of the spectrum, from early childhood education to university. And I was critical. I, I reached a point where I started getting critical of what development organizations are doing in Africa pretending they're doing development, and critical on the way I, too, had acted uh, as a player in that film. So I needed, I desperately said to my wife, I needed desperately uh, an opportunity to catch up on all the mistakes I made for the past two, two decades. <laughs> so she, my wife didn't, she said, well, but you try to do everything good. You got an MBA. You're not running into a business making profit. There's nothing about the wrong with profit, but making more money. But I think you should be happy. I said, I'm not happy because from here I'm going into politics. I don't want that legacy to find, follow me into politics. For people, journalists <laughs> who start digging into my life, people like Paul say, hey, how did he do microfinance in Africa? <laughs> yeah. So I started browsing. I've never heard of AIMS. And then I found the, the website, AIMS jo- South Africa, and I... Coincidentally, I found uh, the job advert for executive director. I didn't know, as Nis mentioned yesterday, that they were looking for an executive director for two years. And then I sent my CV. I waited for six months. <laughs> then six months, uh, Spencer and Stuart called me and said, would you be, well, are you still interested in this? I said, yes, because from what I read, this is going to be a game changer for me. And this is going to offer me the opportunity to correct, uh, at least cleanse my conscience about everything, the way I drove development, thinking I was doing good to my fellow Africans, which was mostly patronizing, telling them what to do, uh, and having a good time. So they said, okay, you're going to meet with the founder. Do you know him, by the way? He's South African. You must have met, met him somewhere. I said, no, Africa is huge. <laughs> <laughs> Africa is huge. <laughs> right? And, and, and then, and then the, the, the lady at the other side of the, the, the phone was very funny. She said, oh, yeah, absolutely, Africa is huge. And I said, there might be more difference between South Africa and Benin than between Benin and Canada. Oh, she said, oh, so, so we laughed. <laughs> so I met with Neil. So, and I'm very, I've been involved in this organization for two and a half years. And truly, it's, it's inspirational for me to have got here. And I found what I was looking for, to be able to serve Africa in a different fashion, in a way that is totally different from the way aid, development assistance, has been working so far. I don't want to say anything controversial, but I just wanted to say that the Africa we are seeing today is totally different from the Africa you knew 10 years ago. Please don't trust what Paul's colleagues are saying in the media. (laughs) They only report things when they're sensational. Oh, somebody, one kid died of hunger in Ethiopia. CNN is there. But when it's going well, CNN is not there. BBC is not there. The changes which are taking place, the transformation, the paradigm shift, nobody's talking about it. And it's coming. And that's how I understand Neil's concept of theory of wave coming. And it's, it's a positive wave, yes. by the way. Yes. Nobody's going to get killed by that wave. No. <laughs> that wave is going to help heal that's, the world. And it's coming from Africa. Right. So Africa has witnessed extraordinary economic growth. And as we speak, Africa will be home, as Lynn, you mentioned, uh, in three decades for over 40% of the world's youth. This tells me and tells us one main thing, 
that Africa's biggest challenge is its youth. And Africa's biggest opportunity, mm. it's also its youth. I was having a meeting with the High Commissioner of Tunisia yesterday. And he said, how do you think this thing came about, the Arab Spring, uh, Tunisia? <laughs> yes, there was a social injustice. But the reality, there was, there was something, there was something burning below that. The first president in Tunisia said, I don't care that much about building roads and skyscrapers. I want all Tunisians to be educated, which was a great vision. Education for all. Everybody should go to school. And if you don't send your daughter or son to school, you get punished. But at the end of the day, three decades for, forward, later down the road, many graduates, you see Tunisians, you see so, having two master's degree, three, four, one PhD or two PhD is common in Tunisia. And there's no job at the end of the tunnel. So, but that's the challenge. But the opportunity is that these people, the young people, Africa's youth is the driving engine of the transformation. And where AIMS fills in, uh, fits into that uh, whole uh, system, development system, is the, the following. You look at Africa, uh, which population will double, uh, who will account for 40% of the world's youth. And 100 years after the Nobel Prize has been instituted, we have today precisely 1,229 Nobel laureates. Africa accounts for just 16. So Africa is, in, is indeed the greatest, biggest untapped pool of talent where the world is going to go and get solution to some of the problems and challenges we are facing today. And that's what we are doing at Ames. We are reinventing the 21st century university, to quote you, Neil, on that. We are reinventing the 21st century university, not just for Africa, but even for countries like Canada. Because our universities have to look at themselves and then transform the way we transmit knowledge and share knowledge is out fa old fashioned now. And what AIMS is doing typically is to train well rounded mathematical scientists. Over the past 10 years, we've been we've successfully trained 560 students. With Canada's support, we've moved for 55 graduates annually to 200 each year. And within the next couple of years, you'll have 200 people, young Africans, completing their PhDs in mathematical sciences, and 500 of them completing their master's degree. But this is just the beginning. What we want is to build a critical mass of well-rounded mathematical scientists to solve Africa's problem, to solve the world's problem, to, 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 for, for them to irradiate and, 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 and have impact uh, beyond the Africa's uh, boundary. I just wanna, want to end by saying this. I was, like Neil, I was on, um, on an interview with a journalist this morning uh, when she said, but mathematics and development, where is the link? <laughs> well, I, you, know, you know, naturally, human being, the response I wanted to give, if I had given that response, the interview would have stopped. <laughs> but I said, no, I have to respond to this. So I said, do you do online transactions these days? She said, yes, oh, this is part of our daily life. So we take online transactions for granted. But actually, what makes that possible is mathematics. You know. Nearly 20 century ago, Euclid, the father of geometry, provided the most rigorous definition for the prime numbers. And the prime numbers, by the way, I was explaining to the journalists, can you remember from high school what the prime numbers are? Oh, uh, yeah, we learned that in Prince but you know I'm not a mathematician. Yeah, I said the prime numbers are numbers which are only divisible by one and themselves. And it's based on the properties of the prime numbers 
that you're doing online bank banking today, that we're doing online transaction. And that's why at Ames, we don't oppose, we don't oppose, oppose theory and, and application. You know, when we engage into the debate of theory, pure mathematics, and apply mathematics, to me and to Ames, it's unnecessary. It's a useless debate. Because when Euclid was in defining the prime numbers, if we have to resurrect Euclid to come back today and to see what he, the, his findings are doing in, the, in our daily lives, I think Euclid would be surprised. <laughs> so I am very happy to have you here. Uh, and um, we am looking forward to the discussion. Uh, the transformation is taking place in Africa. Uh, you just have to dig deeper and to see that there's a paradigm shift. I wanted to end by saying thank you to IDRC, the technicians here in this uh, building who have been, um, and I'm saying this also because I've been in that field for many years. And uh, what I've seen here is another way of partnering for development in Africa, which is built on two things which are key to me in my personal life, dignity and respect. You can take everything that I owe as an African, but I, I require that you respect me and you treat me with dignity. And that's what we find aims, we, we, we at AIMS, we find with IDRC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil Turok, and thank you, Thierry Zamahun, for these introductory remarks. Um, and now it's everyone else's turn, and I'll be playing traffic cop. I'm, <laughs> my name is Paul Wells. I write for McLean's Magazine. I have, for nine years, been going. I need to emphasize that uh, AIMS, is, AIMS is not a Canadian initiative. AIMS is an African initiative, and it only became a Canadian initiative really in 2010, when the yeah. Prime Minister went to Waterloo and announced on behalf of the Government of Canada uh, a, a long-term donation of $20 million to the activities of the African Institutes for Mathematical Sciences. It's IDRC, our hosts today, that have um, been delivering that money, and, uh, and it fulfilled a private hope of mine. For nine years as a journalist, I've been escaping the, the circus on Parliament Hill every once in a while by going to Waterloo to follow the development of the Perimeter Institute, which is the leading physics research institute uh, in, in Canada and becoming one of the leading physics research institutes in the world, uh, in the universe. Uh, in, in 2007, when Neil became the second director of Perimeter, I learned that this fellow from South Africa had this crazy uh, uh, side project in Africa, and I hoped that uh, he would be a lousy compartmentalizer, and that he wouldn't do Perimeter in Waterloo and Ames in Africa, but that he would eventually get mixed up, and it's happened. And um, Canada has become... Uh, the, the people of Canada have become a leading contributor to this project. And uh, that's why I was really excited by this invitation, because it increases the chances that the people of Canada can know what they're in, uh, getting into. Uh, and the best way to do it is to meet some of the alumni uh, of Ames. And, and that's all the folks who, who haven't yet spoken. Um, I'm going to start. We have about a little bit less than an hour to talk among ourselves, but I want you to listen critically and 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 think of all the questions I'm not asking properly, or think of all the answers that they're not giving in in, in sufficient detail. Because in the in the last part of the afternoon's program, we're going to ask you people in the room, and I'm told some people who are participating online, to uh, complete this conversation by adding some questions of your own. Si à ce moment-là, vous avez des questions en français. If you have uh, French questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask them in French. Some people here on the podium are francophone. I, uh, I'm, I like uh, the French language. Any language. Uh, well, or at least two. Um, <laughs> le, my first question is for Martial Defoe, because you're in the video that we saw, and you said that this is a chance for Africa to tell its own story. Uh, before we do that, I want you to tell your story. Uh, you're from Cameroon, yes. and um, and you're at Yale. In two minutes, how did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, in two minutes, how did that happen? Uh, 
I mean, as Paul said, I was born in Cameroon, and uh, I grew up in Cameroon. And as my father and my elder brother, I was interested in mathematics, uh, maybe because I was looking up to my brother and I'm trying to follow in his footsteps. Um, and I went to the University of the Only One, where I did uh, undergrad in mathematics, and also I did started doing graduate school in mathematics. But I was kind of a bit at a dead, uh, getting at the dead end, meaning that I couldn't really find the opportunity to do what I wanted to do. Uh, what I was really interested in, what was my passion about mathematics, was really problem solving. Uh, even when I was very young kid, maybe age of three, my perception of mathematics was just how you figure out how to distribute a suite between your brothers and something like that. <laughs> and for me, it was a ch I was a child, but for me, that was really my perception of mathematics. It was something that you used to solve problems. Um, but then I was kind of getting a bit stuck in my career because we didn't have applied mathematics at the time in Cameroon. And I was so discouraged that I was planning to stop and look for a job or go outside and start buying and selling products as many other people do. And also, just in parentheses, I'm coming from a very unprivileged family. Uh, my mother raised six kids almost on the street. No housing, nothing, nothing at all. Um, and then I heard of AIMS. And for me, that was really the kind of opportunity to go there and see what they're doing. And maybe I'll find what I'm looking for. Uh, but initially, I was very reluctant, reluctant to go to Ames because um, coming from Cameroon, the French-speaking part of Cameroon, I wasn't speaking any English at all at the time. And coming from a poor family, I didn't have money to go and take English classes. And then when they told me that Ames was in South Africa, I told my friends, no, thank you. I don't speak English, and I don't want to go anywhere where they speak English. I want to go to Quebec. <laughs> Everyone does. <laughs> Uh, but my friend told me that uh, the AIMS is different. They are going to teach you English. For me, that was really the game changer. Maybe that is uh, kind of insignificant for the people, but for me, that was very important. That was really the Pan-African spirit. And then I went there, and it taught me English, and it taught me the type of mathematics that I wanted to do. And when I was there, I got an admission to go to University of Cambridge to do a program that is known as Part 3 Math. Uh, very tough. <laughs> and I went there and I did very well, but the confidence that I had to go there and do well was coming from Ames. Having spent nine months with other students from Africa, uh, iron sharpening irons, and I had that confidence. I say, hey, coming from Cameroon, maybe the other people look down on me or say, what type of mathematics do you know? Here is Cambridge, guy. <laughs> but I went there and I did very well. And then I got a position for a PhD. And I did my PhD in University of Cambridge also, and also did very well. And all that I have to say is because of the skill that I got from Ames. Uh, something that we have to know about Cameroon at the time, and that's true for many African countries, and as, as I discovered speaking with my colleagues at Ames. Uh, we didn't really know what computer was. We're doing programming on papers. I don't know if you know what computer programming is, but if you don't have a computer, you don't know, you don't do any programming, but we're doing algorithmic on papers, then we, don't, we didn't know how to implement it, and we're really afraid of computers. And something that you learn at AIMS is how to use a computer, how to write a program, how to write a code, how to do this, which is very important for mathematical scientists today. And basically, that was the foundation on which I kind of did my PhD because my PhD was very computational. And after doing my PhD at uh, Cambridge and getting five publications out of my PhD, very unusual, but that also is a result of being in a very kind of stressful and challenging environment as Ames. Uh, I was without pride almost handpicked to come to Yale. Uh, when I finished my PhD, I had four offers for postdoc, one in Princeton, another one at Yale. Uh, another one in Cambridge to see another one in the Netherlands, and basically, Yale added the kind of sweet to the offer. <laughs> <laughs> and then basically, my boss told me, "Oh, I don't need to give to, to interview you; just come." <laughs> and that's how I find myself at Yale. And after two years of postdoc, now I'm a research faculty at the School of Public Health. And how many years ago did you not speak English? <laughs> <laughs> that is maybe nine years ago. Uh, no, I joined 2000, the second year, five, six. Yeah, it's five, six. So eight years. Okay. Eight years. Well, congratulations on your progress uh, in English. <laughs> I, I, I need to practice mine. Um, uh, 
I, I don't think I'll go through everyone to ask their questions, but I would ask their, their, their whole story. But um, I will ask Marvelous Ono Mukalu, because you were so shy in the sound check, and now I want, I want you to tell everyone. <laughs> oh, from, from Nigeria, now in the Quantum Valley in Waterloo, which is a global, aspires to be a global center for quantum information. And, uh, and again, the same question. How did you get from point A to point B? <laughs> OK. The first thing is, I did not want to study physics. Coming from Nigeria, there is nothing like science. Okay, you have science, but you are, you are seen as someone that you don't have any great future. Once you do anything like physics, mathematics, biology, chemistry, once you do those courses at your undergrad level, then you have no future in the country. So I wanted to study engineering, medicine. I applied for that. But with the nature of the country, I was taken to study physics. Then my friend said, no, you don't have to take that admission. If you go to that physics department, you're not going to do well. I said, why? They said, the department is so tough. The lecturers are so wicked. <laughs> In fact, all you need to do is to reject, decline the admission, and wait Maybe until next year, you apply for a med medical school. I said, all right, let me just try. Let me give it a try and see what will happen. Now, when I got to the department at first, my lecturer said, OK, look, this is what happens. If you are the best student from this department, you're going to get a scholarship in South Africa. I said, wow, what kind of scholarship is that? They said, just study. That was what he said. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He is Tajuddin Ahmed. I think he heard about Ames and the success stories of other Ames alumni. He said, OK, look, I've seen these people. They've gone to Ames, and they're doing well out there. Just make sure you are the best student, and Ames is going to take you. All right. I said, this is a challenge. <laughs> I started. I started. I went through the department. It was tough, but I said, no, let me try. That was as, just as Marshall said, you do programming on paper. Nobody shows you the computer. They tell you a computer is a hardware that does this, sends information. But where is the computer? I don't know where it is. <laughs> but that is it. And we continued this way. At the end of my graduation, I actually did not graduate as the best. Then I said, oh, then I have no hope. Someone now said, Aminat, he's also in South Africa. He was at Ames. She said, no, just give it a try. Ames might take you. Then I applied. I got the admission. One thing now happened. I was at home. I told my family, look, I have this admission. They said, no, that is a scam. There is <laughs> Yes. They said it's a scam that no one can give you this kind of scholarship. The housing is free, the accommodation is free, the feeding is free, transportation all the way from Nigeria to South Africa is free. You're going to be taken care of, you're going to be clothed. It's not possible. <laughs> that is calm. Then I had to contact one of the alumnus, David Onwibe. He said, Ames took you? I said, yes, but my family said it might be scam. How is Ames? He said, look, start dancing. <laughs> now, right away, start dancing. And that was how I said, OK, just give me the confidence. It ain't really what it is. He said, look, my friend, you are lucky. Just start dancing that you have been accepted to come to Ames. Tell your family whatever they want you to do. If they don't want you to come to Ames, be stubborn. This is what we call be stubborn for your future. Now I said, OK, fine. He said, look. OK, what is it? We've trained you through school because they were scared. They thought I was going to say, OK, please give me money for my school fees. I told them, look, I don't need anything from you. All I want to tell you is that I'm leaving at so-so time. They said, OK, that's fine. Go. No problem, just go. And I got to Ames from Amadebella University, a very large university, the second largest university in sub-Saharan. I got to Ames, one small building. I said, wait. <laughs> From, from, my, from my university, and this is the way education is. How can something good come out of this building? <laughs> I said, all right, let's see what will happen. 
restarted? My, wow, I said all right. I'm interacting with people like Neil. You see lecturers come all the way. I said, wow. You see Alan Bearden from Cambridge. I interact with him. We dine at the same table. I said, this is really humility at the greatest extent. We eat at the same table. We have lectures together. You are at the lab doing all your research, taking classes with tutors. I said, all right, this is the best I ever wanted. And that was how I got real lucky during one of the blocks. My current supervisor at the University of Waterloo, Robert Mann, he was there to teach us hmm. particle physics. And that was how he got interested in me. He said, look, why don't you apply to the University of Waterloo? I said, OK, but you do something like gravity, gravity, gravity. I wanted to do nanotechnology. I've looked at my country. Gravity, how can gravity help my country? All right, he said, mm, I also do a little bit of quantum information. Come, you can do quantum information. Because I, why I actually did not want to work with him initially, since all he does is gravity. I looked at it, that, OK. Um, it's OK that research in Canada and the United States is basically black holes, dark energy matter, I said, maybe because of the tornado, the kind of disasters that usually occur here. <laughs> but in my country, I think our major problem is not about gravity. I said, all right, quantum information, it's OK. Since he also does something on quantum information, let me go ahead. And he said, good. Are you OK? You want to come to Canada? But there is one thing you should also know. It's very cold. I said, cold? <laughs> I'm, I'm an African. We can withstand anything just to get what we want for our future. <laughs> he now said, fine, then come. Just do the application. And I got here. I started work with him. And currently, I'm doing my master's. I've completed a year. And I've got a paper out of quantum information. And as Neil rightly said, the transistors, the good laptops you have, I don't think it would have been possible today if not because of the progress in physics and mathematical sciences. And we hope in future, quantum information, getting quantum devices, getting quantum computers, you are going to get to the extent whereby you process your information with maximum security, highest precision that you ever imagined. Thank you. Oh, what, what the heck? Let's just go around the circle. Um, <laughs> it's, it's easy work for me. Um, no CP, will, did I get that right? Yeah. Yes. No You're over at Perimeter. You're across town uh, at Perimeter Institute. Are you studying gravity? <laughs> uh, yes. I know there's guys there. There's guys there who do a lot of gravity at Perimeter. Um, you, same question. How did you get from Swaziland to Perimeter? Okay, uh, when I finished, oh, even in high school, like my interest in physics began in high school. Like we had a program where like there was a problem solving. We had once in a year where like best students from each high school, not all high schools, just some high schools, will go in the hall and then they'll give you questions and then you'll think about them and then you write up your solution, and then you try to present it. So I, every year I would be really excited looking forward to that event. I really got excited doing that. So when I finished high school, I was the best in my country, and like everyone felt like they should tell me what to do. Like, <laughs> And everyone told me to go for BCom. Uh, business studies, and my parents and everyone at home was talking me into doing that. So I knew I didn't want to do it, but when you have everyone telling you it's the right thing to do, you end up going for it. So I applied for BCom in University of Swaziland. I was accepted, and then I sat in class for two weeks, and I didn't like it. So. <laughs> I applied to change, and fortunately for me, the science department took me in, and I was at home. I really enjoyed it there. 
and I had to go back home and tell them I was not doing what they wanted me to do, which was tough. And towards the end, it, my BSc was only four years. On the fourth year, I had enjoyed my undergraduate studies, but it was coming to an end. Now I didn't know what to do. Like, like my parents and everyone had warned me, when you do become, then you have a chance to get employed. But if you do BSc, then it's the end. <laughs> so I was trying to find a school in South Africa, and then I came across Ains. It looked very good in paper, so I was excited, but I, no one in Swaziland had gone there before, so I really had no one to ask. And then I asked one of my lecturers. Fortunately, he had been there for a conference. And he told me, oh, it's a very good program. He helped me apply. And fortunately, I was accepted. So by the time I graduated, I, was, I already had a place to go. So my way was just clean. And, but my father was excited. Like I graduated very with good results, like the best in my university that year. My father was really excited. And then I said, I'm not going to work. I'm going to South Africa to study. <laughs> and it's very difficult to explain physics, what you do in physics. <laughs> and it's really difficult. And then when I went to Ames, he was happy that I'm prospering in life, but he wasn't happy that I'm not going to work. When I got to Ames, you know, I was very excited. We worked all night. <laughs> and one thing I would have already said, like how beautiful the academics are at Ames. But one good thing that I learned that we could sit down as Africans and talk about the problems that I see in my country that are not as different as the problems they have in Cameroon, as the problems they have in Malawi. And in a way, the network that we have formed and the plans that we have for Africa as the AIMS alumni, and if we keep it this way and we continue joining hands, and as we have the same problems, we will be able to solve them, we hope, in the future. And then, Going back to my academic life, when I finished at Ames, I was fortunate to be accepted at Perimeter Institute to do the physics that I like. <laughs> what are you studying at Perimeter? What's your specialization? Uh, quantum gravity. Quantum gravity. Please. Lee Smolin? No. No. Okay. Oh, okay. Very interesting. Um, now, you touched a little bit on the 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 question that floats over these the, the, this this organization, which is uh, how does it um, relate to the lives of Africans? How does it relate to the future of Africa? And for some people, it's a very difficult question to answer. But uh, one of your colleagues here on the stage, Felix from Nigeria. Um, your current field of study is very close to the future of Africa mm -hmm. because you're studying, um, uh, seismic analysis uh, and, and, and essentially the structure of, of the Earth at University of British Columbia because that's where uh, natural resource treasure lies and that's, it, that's uh, one of the, one of the um, uh, new developments that's really changing the, 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 the present of Africa. Can you tell us how you, where you come from and how you came to be studying this sort of stuff at UBC? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, when in 2007, um, when I graduated from my home institution in Nigeria at the University of Ibadan in, in the physics department, um, very similar to the story uh, Marvelous gave. Physics and mathematics, these were not disciplines um, students wanted to go into because we, we were made to believe that these were disciplines without a future in Nigeria. So people wanted to go into fields like engineering and medicine. And um, parents, some parents will be sort of disappointed when their children are going to study physics and mathematics. Um, so I was chosen to study physics, and um, at the stage when I graduated, luckily for me, I was uh, the president of the student body. So we only had one computer, 
um, for the over 200 students in the department. So as a president, I saw that as an advantage for me to, to make use of, of the computer. So it was during that time, uh, as a, um, uh, during my tenure, I was able to look into the future. And I came across Ames. And I thought, wow, this is a place where um, physics and mathematics has been appreciated. And hopefully, this is a place where I'll be able to apply my physics. Because we, all, we did a lot of theoretical stuff, and there was no application. So subsequently, I was um, invited to Ames. I was, my, my application was accepted. And when I came to Ames, what really uh, impressed me was the, the fact that I could do a lot of programming. Because like some people have said here, yeah, the programming we did was on paper. Even first four years in the university, we did programming on paper. Uh, there was no way to visualize and you know, see numerical solutions to analytical solutions. So uh, that was one thing we were able to, to get at Ames. And um, at Ames, we, Ames invites international lecturers from Europe and from North America to come and give courses. And you could see the clear cut difference between the way Americans or you know, foreign lecturers teach compared to the way African lecturers teach. And um, I have a passion for teaching. So I was just keen to the style and the approach in which these guys come to teach. And um, I completed the program, went to the University of Cape Town, got a master's. By the way, <coughs> through Ames, I was able to connect with local um, South African lecturers one of whom accepted me for a master's position. And I completed that program and went back to Ames as a teaching assistant. And it was during my time there as a teaching assistant. I met these two young women there. I was their teaching assistant. And then I was also privileged to meet another international, like, international lecturer from the University of British Columbia. And he was very interested and fascinated you know, in my goal which is wanting to do something in applied, physic, in applied physics. And he subsequently connected me with um, a professor at the University of British Columbia, whom I'm currently working with now for my PhD. And um, so I, I came to, well, prior, prior to coming to UBC, I was privileged to come to Calgary in 2010, where my, um, I came to present a paper, um, which was a uh, shoot of my MSc. So when I came to Calgary, presented my paper at the conference, I, I fell in love with the country. And I thought, oh, Canada, I'll probably come back to Canada to do a PhD. And that is how I eventually came to Canada to, to start up a PhD. And I think the relevance of what I'm doing today to, to Africa is that, not just to Africa, but to the entire world, because I'm working on a very challenging problem. And um, the relevance is, one, I'm looking at how we can change the way teaching is done. Having been through the system of AIMS and coming to North America, I believe that if the way teaching is done is, is um, fine-tuned a little bit in, in, in Nigeria and in the rest of Africa, um, most Africans may not aspire to go out and get that quality education we, which we all crave. And I'm happy that the AIMS Next Einstein Initiative is looking at expanding centers you know, hopefully in the near future there will be one in Nigeria. And that will be a model that will actually transform the way teaching is done in Africa and actually bring out the best of the scientists and eventually bring out the next Einstein in Africa. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Felix. Um, <laughs> Richard, is your, is your mic ready to go? Or is your... Richard? But, are you ready to talk? I yep. so. OK. I just want to make sure our technical stuff was, was working. Um, our last alumnus up on the stage is in a different sort of program. You're in a work placement at Waterloo. Everyone who goes to study the, the, the tech community in Waterloo, one of the, like the second or third thing that they take you to see is Communitech, which is um, uh, a, a, an incubator for a bunch of uh, tech startups in a big old uh, industrial building in downtown Waterloo, I believe. Kitchener, Waterloo. Kitchener. Kitchener. Uh, I'll get it right one day. And, um, and and that's where you're working now. So you're you're kind of part way between where you've come and where you're going, yeah. uh, as in fact are all of us. But uh, <laughs> maybe you can tell that story. You're from Malawi, and you're working uh, until December at uh, at Communitech, and then and then what happens? Get it? Uh, uh, as uh, my fellow alumni uh, have said, 
I'm also from a, a humble background, I can say so. Uh, for me, I faced challenges even before starting undergraduate studies. Uh, my family could not afford for my undergraduate studies, so I was forced to start with a diploma in education uh, sciences. Uh, being education sciences, uh, it meant that, uh, like in Malawi, if you join teaching, you die a teacher and you die poor because, because of the salaries. The, in teaching, it's, the remuneration is not that good. So, but I had a vision like, okay, since my family could not afford to pay my uh, undergraduate studies, uh, if I start with a diploma, then I'll be independent. Then from that, I'll pay my own, on my own, in terms of the uh, bachelor's degree. Uh, lucky enough, after graduating, uh, I started teaching in a government high school. Uh, but soon after that, I still wanted to go back to school. So for me to go back, it would mean to take, uh, uh, like, to wait for two years to finish probation, then apply for uh, educational leave. After just a year, lucky enough, uh, I applied for educational leave, uh, and I got it before two years. Then I went to for a BSc, uh, which was in, I graduated in 2009. After graduating, uh, I went back to teaching. Though I was teaching, uh, I still had a different uh, vision. Uh, I wanted to apply uh, mathematics and ICT in health sector. That has been my dream. So after teaching at a high school uh, for two years, in 2012, which is last year, uh, my friend was uh, applying for EMS. Then he just uh, told me, uh, could you try to uh, apply also for EMS? Then I said, but the, this is all mathematics again. So it means I'll also go back to teaching. Then after uh, going through the website uh, for uh, EMS, I found out that it's not the kind of mathematics I know. It's a different mathematics. It's more of applied problem solving and the structure itself. Uh, I'm, we are used to, uh, we, we call it a, a study to pass, like most of the times. So you could just study uh, for exam sake, then pass. But I found out that AIMS, it's a different thing. The, it's not emphasizing on passing aspect. It's emphasizing on problem solving aspect and what you are going to gain after that. So uh, after applying for AIMS, then uh, I started my, my, uh, uh, my studies in August last year. Mm -hmm. uh, while uh, doing my studies, uh, then there is a new program being introduced for AIMS, of which maybe uh, most of my friends have not mentioned it, which is uh, uh, industry initiative, which they, they are also bringing in the relationship between the industry and mathematics while you are at EMS. So it is entrepreneurship skills, uh, employability skills. So through that, uh, I learned about the internship program. Uh, then there were uh, different companies. Uh, they uh, advertised for positions. One of them was Comunitech uh, in Kitchener. Then I applied. Uh, they wanted a uh, uh, web and mobile application developer. So I applied. Uh, they was interviewed through Skype. From there, then, like enough, I was uh, successful. Then in June, uh, on 30th June, it's when I came to Canada for, I'll be here for six months until December. Yes. Okay. So thanks to all of you. 
for these fascinating stories. And I, I, I'm struck by well, uh, many things, but um, one of them is the, is the extent to which most of you come from uh, a situation with very few materials and very few resources at hand learning to program on paper because there's no computers to program with. One computer for 200 students. Uh, I've been out on book tour with my iPod, my Samsung, my Blackberry, my laptop, and my tablet. So that's, that's, that's five to one. <laughs> is there a sense, as you look at your, at your new colleagues and your new friends in Canada, is there, is there a sense in which your background provides advantages? Uh, how so? Marvelous. So there you go. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, if you look at it, my background is not so bad. The only thing is that, just as um, Felix rightly pointed, we have the theoretical background. Like we have, we are made to learn, although under difficult condition, but we know the theoretical aspect, but we don't know how to apply them into problem solving. Now, when we got to Ames, they taught us that, okay, since they saw the potential in us, they said, if we know the mathematics, the theory, now come, I will teach you how to apply this into solving problems in the world. Mm -hmm. And that is how it is, we got to Ames. In fact, not just African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, we gave it another name. African Institute for Missing Sleep. <laughs> because, yes, you walk all night, the okay, the computer is there. We were excited that, wow, this is how exactly it is. Two plus two is equal to five. I can see it there. I can write the code. All right, they, they tell you, write maybe a program that has to do with, you have this, um, you're making sales, computer program that solves this problem, and they tell you, okay, go, Python. I said, wow, Python, what is Python? You see the computer, you're in front of the computer, and exactly, it gives you, you write the algorithm on paper, and you implement it on the laptop there. It gives you the solution. I said, wow, this is exactly how things are going, okay? And you also come to physics. Current, current is moving, electrons are moving, and how exactly can you figure it out? They tell you, okay, current electrons are moving through the conductors. How are they moving? How exactly are people implementing it? You go to your computer, it runs there. So with that, I think our background gives us the theoretical knowledge, and there in front of us, we're able to implement it and see how exactly it works. Because if you don't know the main the main theoretical background, if you don't have the theoretical background, if you don't know what conduction is, you will not be able to implement it on that system. Not only that, okay, I see it also as we are determined from our background because of the way you're forced, not that you're forced, nobody cares. If you, if you want to study, come and study. So because we want to study, we want, we are interested in studying, we are determined, we want to make our lives better, we need a better future, because of that, we said, okay, even if our universities, my home university says, nobody cares about you, just do whatever you want to do, they make, it, they make life difficult for you. We don't care. We are determined to do it. And because of that, that is it. We do it. We get the background. And when we got to Ames, we saw everything flowing the way it is. And I did a project on metrology. It says, okay, Okay, it, it, it all has to do with this is, okay, we have the seven basic units of measurement and the basic, the basic standard unit of measurement, the SI unit. And now it tells you this is how we have current standard, we have the luminous intensity standard, and everything I did the research, I said, wow, this is interesting. This is how quantum information is coming about. This is how measurement is coming about. Why don't I continue something like that? So with the whole quantum mechanical background, with the whole determination, I think the main thing is that we were determined to make our future better. And so with that determination and with the hard work that we have from home, you can relate it and say, right. Thierry, you're nodding your head. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I, I was just going to uh, add a piece to that, that when you look at uh, AIMS, the AIMS environment, Paul, it's much more than postgraduate education. 
it's much more than mathematical sciences. You have people in 50 people in one classroom from 40 countries in Africa sharing key life learning processes which goes beyond mathematics. That's where, for instance, a Nigerian will get to meet for the first time in her life a guy from Tunisia, from Morocco, and an Egyptian will get to meet a guy from Swaziland without being able to point where Swaziland is on the African map. So they will talk to about Africa's problems and what is good, they talk about Africa's problem and how Africa can help solve the world's problem. Mm -hmm. That to me is a game changer. Mm -hmm. I like to say that at AIMS, young African goes through a cultural transformation. Mm -hmm. It's a new, totally new paradigm that has nothing to do with the way even somebody like me, I'm not that old, I'm still calling myself young, <laughs> right? So the way we were programmed to think is totally different with what you see at Ames. And it may look natural, but it's not natural because in the African context, we are pushing some kind of change, transformation. So cultural transformation is one. And the second one, the Pan-African nature of Ames bringing all of them together, but not just the Pan-African nature. When I look at people, dignitaries saying, I'm a world citizen, sometimes I wonder, do they really know what they're talking about? You want to learn, learn world citizenry, come to a name center where we have 30 to 50 world-class lecturers coming from around the world, mm -hmm. Australia, North uh, Scandinavia, Europe, North America, Brazil, South America. So coming from there, at the same place, you have, you have all those nationalities at the same place with 40 nationalities across uh, the continent. It tells you something that I think sociologists can study and see how this is going to be of uh, a great benefit. It's a subversive idea, isn't it? It's, it's a, it, disruptive, it, a disruptive... It breaks all the rules of day-to-day exactly. -day life exactly. in these countries. Yeah. It does. Was that the plan, Neil? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, my parents were certainly subversives. They were revolutionaries. And that's what I, what I learned at home, is uh, when you know, the apartheid state was seemingly invincible, uh, certain people said, no, we're not going to accept it. Let's uh, overthrow it. So that was my background. So it was very natural to try to look at uh, recreating a university, but in a much more subversive way. Um, and, and subversion means you have, to, you have to have confidence in something, okay? Otherwise, it would fail. And I want to give you an example. I mean, I think you know, what happened in South Africa, we had almost no money. We had this derelict hotel. 28 students arrived in the first year. There was a pile of rubble in the, in the common room. I mean, the, the institute wasn't finished. Uh, and that was great. All the students participated in, in uh, the establishment of the center. Uh, I was paranoid about security, so I hired, South Africa is not that safe, so we hired a security guard outside, we had one in the entrance, um, and you know, over a few months we realized these students are perfectly capable of running the institute. And this culture developed within Ames of the students actually being responsible, right? And, and that's what has grown over the last 10 years. Is you now walk into Ames, it's the safest place you can be. People leave a cell phone, laptop in the computer lab. Everyone trusts each other. Each other. It's a, remarkable. So the image of Africa as being an insecure continent is completely overturned when you're at Ames. There's people just live and share and relax. And this, this grew. And I'll give you an example. So we opened uh, Cameroon uh, uh, last month. And uh, Thierry was the one driving this. I mean, he, 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 he wanted to press for it. Now, Cameroon is a difficult environment, very difficult. Um, uh, the, the, yeah, I, I, I won't go into all the problems, but there are many, many problems. And many people were quite shocked, including our alumni. How did you succeed <laughs> in opening a center in Cameroon? There was one thing that gave us confidence which is that when we assemble this group of 40 students from across the continent together, we know what they'll be like. We, we trusted them. And we trust them with the center. There were two staff 
in the beginning of Ames Cameroon, right? Mm -hmm. Hired quite a rapid process. I mean, even eight weeks before the center opened, uh, you know, nothing was quite ready. Everything put together at the last minute. But we had confidence that these students are amazing young people. And a very special chemistry happens when you put young Africans together uh, because of the trauma they have all suffered, because they feel this is a home and we're building it ourselves. And almost all the other academics and the staff are, are sort of second, secondary importance. The key is the students themselves. That's why I'm so confident about the future of Ames. Uh, because we've discovered a new force of nature, which is young African scientists. And <laughs> I wonder whether for any of our alumni guests, your experience at Perimeter was, or at Ames, Ames. <laughs> was the first time uh, you felt African in any, in any sort of real sense, or whether, as opposed to being from your, from your town, from your city, from your home country. I don't want to sentimentalize it, but is that, is that something that you felt when you, when you moved to South Africa and started studying with people from all these other countries? Uh, yeah, Richard. <laughs> uh, as for me, uh, it was first time to go out of my country. And apart from that, I, I realized that being uh, an institute where African students will be, I really wanted to experience the uh, different problems my friends from different uh, African countries uh, uh, have faced. At the same time, being from different background, it means we are from this cultural diversity of which I also wanted to learn how my friends from other countries, the, their culture, uh, religious belief. So at Ames, we work together as a group. You have something in common. So that also helped me to make a decision to go at Ames, to meet uh, students from all over Africa and share the problems of Africa. Anybody else? No see people. Oh, when I went to Ames, like, I was closer to home because South Africa is close to Swaziland, but there were so many people from Egypt, from Morocco. So, but I realized something like, I was the only Swazi, so I felt more Swazi. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I was representing the whole of Swaziland. But I felt, I realized something. We were all, in some way, we were all the same. We were all having the same problems. And we were all looking forward to solving the same problems in a way. And oh, after my master's in Canada, I went back to Africa in Ghana, where I was tutoring for four months. When I was there, the group, there was, it was a new group of students, but they were the same as us. They were also like from different countries, and they were still faith. Like when they came together and talked, they called it like solving the problems of Africa. They had, we had meetings on Thursdays at seven, so we would discuss the problems that we have in different countries in Africa and try to come up with solutions. And we realized something, it's all the same. Basically, there are some differences here and there, but mostly there are the same problems that we have. Okay. Yeah. I may add, I may sure. add something very important here. We have many dignitaries across Africa who are visiting the Institute. The day before yesterday, President Maki Sall of Senegal went to the Institute. Uh, four weeks ago, it was the former Governor General of Canada who visited uh, M. Senegal. And uh, I'll give two examples. One high-ranking government official, uh, I won't name the country, I won't name them, went to Ames, one of our Ames Institute. He said, this, he's an academic. He spent his entire life in academia. He said, this is the very first time as an academic I'm standing in a room of 36 students from so many diverse countries across the, this continent. Gosh, what have I, have I missed in my career? <laughs> Number one, 
another person, a head of state, who said, if we, the, my generation of African leaders, we were trained this way, in this fashion, there will be less conflict in Africa. Hmm. There will be less disaster. Because it will be very difficult for, um, for Martial. Yeah. Nigeria and the Cameroon has fought over Bakasi many years. It will be very difficult for them if they reach the leadership. Uh, marvelous president of Na uh, Nigeria, good luck, Jonathan, should be hearing me and see that you're coming. And you, president of Cameroon, it will be difficult for them to wage war on each other. Okay. This is the whole aims. So it's not just mathematical sciences. Mm -hmm. It's the collateral benefit we're reaping from this. Now, almost for, and then after, after this, we're going to go to questions from the floor, so get ready. Um, Almost for the, same, for the same reason, there is a long history of mistrust of superbly educated cosmopolitan people by members of civil society in their home countries and by figures in authority. Have any of you run into that? Do, does, does anyone uh, worry about you now that you've gone through this experience back home? <laughs> Uh, I would not say that people worry about us. Uh, I personally am speaking here from experience. Uh, but I think that people trust us even more because I think that what young Africans are looking for is for an example of something that works. Uh, I just take my case, for example, when I went to Ames, that was the second set, and people were very skeptical of the new idea. Oh, you're going to get there and waste your time. You're going to do this, going to do that. And a lot of my classmates were very good at mathematics, did not apply at all, because kind of, okay, go there. If you get burned, we'll see. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went there, and I came back with that admission from Cambridge, and on my way to Cambridge, and that just changed everything <laughs> in the department, everywhere. Right. Every, I mean, instead of looking at me differently, people just realize that, hey, there is an opportunity there. There is something that works there. And it's the same thing now, even when I'm going back home. Parents want me to talk to their children. They want me to share my story with them. And just a case, for example, just to mention, I'm going to Brazil every year to talk to young people because of AIMS, kind of sharing my story with them. And I, I, I think that is kind of what is happening. And I don't think that it's kind of a, oh, these people, these intellectual people, they are we kind of scare of them or whatever, but uh, it's really kind of embr embracing the, the spirit of it. So it's very hard for people to imagine doing being the first, but it's much easier for people to imagine being like him, right? Yeah. Like, and, <laughs> and and I so the the, the next two thousand alumni will be easier than the first five hundred. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. Uh, these are pioneers. Yeah. Uh, who has questions from the floor? Over here. I'm Anne Weston from RDRC. One of the joys of working here is being able to work with people like you and hear you talk. Um, one of the questions I had at the start was whether or not there's a prejudice that Neil didn't mention, which is, and you, a lot of you, you've spoken about the prejudice really against science, perhaps, in the communities that you come from, and I think that's probably also quite a common problem in Canada. But one of the issues in Canada and in the States that often is talked about is the prejudice against women in science, but nobody's mentioned that today, and so I'm thinking, well, maybe it's not really a problem, and so I would just, just be interested in, in your comments. Thanks. I'll take them too, and then, okay. and then you know. Okay, when I was doing physics in my undergraduate in my home university, I was the only female, but when I went to Ames, it was a different place, like there was some so many women like in the class, so I became really comfortable. And yeah, I would say Ames, we have a lot of women going doing science. Hmm. Okay, so first of all, like from where I come from, they want you to study. But the issue is that in physics department, as I said, is a very tough department. It's a department where they say that you have to be a man before you have to be in the department. So I had just very few number of women in the department. So as I would say, I, that was why I was kind of discouraged. Please don't go there. But I was strong enough. I got there. I did well. And I got to Ames. I found myself that, oh, you're not the only one in sciences. 
there are other people in sciences, and okay, Marvi, you have to, marvelous, you have to continue. However, when I got here in Canada, there is going to be a conference of African, oh no, not African, of women in physics by next, coming next year. So before you can actually attend the program, you have to meet your directors from different countries. And I've seen that Nigeria is not, maybe they, is not, they are not enrolled. That implies that there are actually no much scientists, women in, women, okay, women in science in Nigeria. So one of the driving force, Ames have shown me that, look, this is science, and there are lots of things women can actually do science. So one of the, okay, one of my future ambition is to see that I'll go back home, talk to different, if I can talk to different families, talk to different universities, look, do not make science so difficult for these people. Tell these women that there is also hope for them. So I think the way it is, women, African women, not just African women, worldwide, women very soon, you're going to have a lot of women doing sciences just because of aims and the way they have made me to think. Thierry, you just uh, very quickly, a number, it's still an issue. Uh, women in science is still an issue in Africa and even globally here in Canada is still a problem. Uh, but what we have done in, in, at AIMS is to take a delivery strategy toward including women. As we stand, of the 560 alumni we currently have, 30% of them are women. And the ultimate goal within a short period of time is to reach the 50-50. And it's not just to plead uh, uh, feminist or to plead uh, compassionate people, but it's just justice. Very good. Yeah. There's another question over here. Yes. Um, um, I'm a retired English professor, so I'm not expert on any of these matters, although I guess I know a little bit about education. But what uh, comes to mind uh, in listening to this, and it seems a wonderful program, I don't mean to put it down, but it reminds me of another program of a similar nature emanating from South Africa uh, by Cecil Rhodes, and gotten by Cecil Rhodes uh, a little over a century ago, I guess now. And the purpose of that um, project was to bring people to Oxford and educate them in such a way that this would perpetuate the dominance of the Anglosphere uh, for all time. I'm quite sure that's not the motive here, but I wonder if you could speak to that. These people of all different languages I, are speaking English. Their education is in English. Uh, and has that issue come up at all? And Thank you. Yeah. Neil, maybe that's... Be happy, be happy to answer that. Um, yeah, I think AIMS is exactly the opposite of the Rhodes Fellowships. Uh, the whole point of AIMS is to bring the teachers to Africa and have the, and build institutions in Africa uh, whose ethos is uh, commitment to Africa. And so, yes, make use of international volunteers and supporters, but they're only there for three weeks. Okay, they can't create too much trouble in three weeks, <laughs> and they can't exert uh, undue influence in three weeks. So the institutes are locally owned, locally run, dominated by the Pan-African student body, and so the people who come in to offer to, to share their skills and their knowledge are doing so as a contribution, but not to control. But it is English, right? Uh, no, actually, that's not even right. So when we opened the center in Senegal, uh, of course, the natural assumption was this would be francophone yeah. center. And we said, no, it's got to be dual. Yeah. And so we have bilingual. So Africans, in, in general, are more capable of speaking multiple languages than people on other continents. Uh, many Africans speak five languages uh, fluently. And uh, so we said, OK, let's have Africa set the example. AIM Senegal is going to be bilingual. So we'll have French Francophone lecturers coming in. They will teach. The tutors, various things have been tried. Uh, essentially, the I mean, I even teach in French in, in AIM Senegal. Uh, each year, a uh, combination of French and English. And the students, you know, mathematics is uh, above any of these languages. So it's truly universal. So it's easier to do it in maths. And we found that model to be very successful. 
Um, I think uh, one of the students in the video says she, and, and Marcel said he learned English very quickly. Uh, generally, out of, say, 55 to 60 students per year in South Africa, you will find one francophone, typically about 15 of those would be francophone, and one of them would have difficulty, so that by the end of the year they're still sort of struggling to have a conversation. But 14 out of the 15 will be absolutely fine. I went to Senegal, you know, the first student I met, I said, bonjour, comment ça va? Uh, you know, how are things going? I was speaking in French a little bit, and his French was absolutely perfect. And uh, and, and, and this is only three months into the year. I said, um, oh, where are you from? He said, Nigeria. <laughs> and his French was much better than mine, <laughs> OK? And uh, so, so that's what's happening. And I think uh, overcoming language barriers is extremely important. Uh, well, of course, I wasn't thinking of English French issue, but yeah. African languages. Yeah, African versus English. Yeah. So uh, no, it's true. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a real uh, another issue. Hmm. And uh, at some point, when it's faced with the dilemma, uh, you have countries in Africa where we have three, over 300 languages. Uh, from my village, you walk two kilometers away from my village, what they're talking, the language they're speaking there, you can't understand them. So at some point, I think some of the political leadership in Africa, they've tried to say, OK, let's look at the major languages. Uh, but it's going to take a process uh, to get the, those languages transcribed and then to you know, inject them into the educational system. It's going to take a process. And by then, we, we need to continue to catch up and leapfrog uh, technological and technical or scientific breakthroughs. We don't want to wait for our kids to catch up on African languages first. So, but this is definitely something that linguists uh, uh, and, and the political leadership, they are thinking of. Because there are institutions who are teaching in Yoruba, for instance, uh, Wolof in Senegal, and but there are major languages like Swahili. The people can do research in those languages, but the multiple other ones. Yeah, is, um, but, but let me also say, I mean, the dominant language on the internet is English, and uh, the, what the students tell us very often is, in fact, this happened in Senegal. They said we don't want to be taught in French, okay, because we want access to world scientific journals. So please. Uh, encourage English speaking lecturers to come. We have to learn it because effectively the most important language in science is English right now. That may change. Chinese may become the most important language. Um, we'll all have to learn Chinese. Still a component. No, I wouldn't say so. Um, I mean, I, I think you know, what was so interesting and very disappointing was in June we had the first Ames alumni reunion in Cape Town. Uh, 110 alumni were able to come to Cape Town, and it was an incredible event, wonderful event. But uh, at the same time, Barack Obama came to South Africa. And he had made, he has so far um, not done much, let's say, on the African scene. One of the big announcements in 2010, he's he said, we're going to create scientific centers of excellence in, Ax in Africa. And we thought, oh, great, they're going to support us or do something. And nothing happened. Okay, But he came to Cape Town. And the reason I mention it is he announced a new program of fellowships called Washington Fellows. Okay, So he announced the creation of 1,000 Washington Fellowships to take top African students to the US to be interns in Congress, in US companies, to basically stay there for a year or two and go back to Africa as friends of the US. And I'm quoting his words. It was unbelievable. It was returning to the 1950s or before. So unfortunately, the Obama and the US administration seems to have taken a giant step backwards. And uh, you know, the whole point of Ames is to build from Africa. So it's, it's a privilege for an international lecturer to go there. You know, what, what we're offering actually is fellowships to come and look at Africa. Okay, for those people. Uh, and of course, to brainwash them and to tell them, you know, Africa's the place to be. And I, and I must say, you know, we have more volunteer lecturers than any other institution I know of. It's very, very hard to lecture at Ames because the standard is high and we, we have 500 volunteer lecturers. We only need 25 per year uh, per center. 
it's very, very hard to be accepted. Uh, so it is a privilege to, to go there and to see the future, which will be Africa. Okay, I, I, I just want to say, we've got 10 minutes before we've got to wrap this up. Terry's got a flight to catch. Uh, I want to get through the questions at these two microphones. My mathematical expertise tells me that's five minutes for each question and answer round. <laughs> so let's start over here. Thank you, Trado Speed. It's such inspiring to see all this uh, because we have the habit to see uh, bright people in Africa but always in the diaspora and this is uh, an initiative that comes from Africa that is made in Africa. But I will ask a question that does not need an answer now. Maybe we'll think about it, all of us. Uh, what is the next step? Great. Those people are really great people, but uh, for our growth, we must have economic project. Mm -hmm. And those aims just think about how to bring back those people to have a brilliant project that will uh, make increase our economy, or is it just mm -hmm. all? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And over here. Yeah, my name is Stephen Davis from Academics Without Borders Canada. How many of your graduates are now working in African universities and doing research there? Let's just exclude South Africa, which has a very well-developed system of higher education and universities. How many of them are working in other countries in Africa? Actually, I will include South Africa because you, I, I can tell you Senegal has also uh, a quality you academic have, You have over education. 500 graduates. Sorry? You have over 500, 500 graduates? 500. How many of those 560 are in Africa? 70% of them are in Africa. And then the 30% you have around here, which includes these gentlemen, uh, 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 are doing projects, like uh, Martial, for instance, working on a project at Yale. Uh, to investigate, explore the linkage between uh, schizotosomiasis, schizotosomiasis, HIV, and malaria. So even those who are here, some of them are still reading the PhD, they're still doing the project, and they have plans uh, to sort of not just physically go to Africa. You can be physically sitting down in Africa and be useless there. <laughs> so, but do something. But it's a good question because uh, sometimes people want to see, you know, of all these uh, talent that you are uh, training, okay. how many of them are in Africa and working and living? Seven out of ten. Yeah. And to the, to the question here, it's a great question. I think we cannot answer that in two minutes, but I can give you three things. Uh, apart from the, one of the core, the core pillars of AIMS is the cutting edge postgraduate mathematical training. You have research, you have outreach. The program we are integrating with our partners like IDRC in our program now is the AIMS industry. One is the AIMS industry initiative, uh, which is to bridge the gap between real business life and mathematical sciences, which is about creating an internship opportunities and build a new generation of entrepreneurs. You know, mathematical scientists, sometimes they're afraid of, you know, taking initiative. They are very happy to be hiding in a corner in their lab doing their science. And when you talk about entrepreneurship, people talk, think about business schools. I said, gosh, if scientists had to take you know, a step forward and do entrepreneurship and get themselves, throw themselves out there, they would do a better job than people from business school who don't have mathematical skills. So that's number one. So the, the other core program, what's next? It's a good question. We, are gen we want to create a critical mass of mathematical sciences across Africa. And so what? And so what? We want also to recognize them, to acknowledge the technical breakthrough, the technical advances that they're making, the research they're making. That's why our mandate is to lead the transformation. And we, we say that without apology. We, we, to lead the transformation of Africa through innovative scientific training, 
technical advances and breakthrough discoveries which benefit the whole of society. So we want to, we are creating, launching something, and a great initiative, which is called the Next Einstein Forum. If you wanted to know what we're meaning by Next Einstein Forum, think of Davos. It will be the Davos in science on the African soil. Because African scientists don't, don't have a say. They can't come to North America and, and speak and say, I'm doing this research, I want the whole world to know. We want to provide them with a platform to talk. And we want to prove, I was talking to NASA, Director of Science and Innovation of IDRC, who said, I'm quoting you, NASA, I'm not sure if I, I get it right. You don't need to go to Tokyo to do good science. You don't need to go to uh, uh, London or Paris to show that you're doing breakthrough research. You can do it in Swaziland. You can do it in Senegal, in Cameroon. That's the objective of this. And we will award awards that will be the equivalent of the Nobel Prize, hopefully, in the next decades. Does anyone, do any of our alumni want to answer that question or address that question of what happens next, what should happen next? Uh, I can, Felix. Yeah. Um, Currently, we have um, alumni who are working on models to um, solve the problem. One of the problems Africa has is um, what, uh, malaria disease. So we have alumni who are doing research in that area. And I believe that we have these alumni, as long as they continue working in that area, they'll be able to come up with models that will be able that, that uh, Africa would implement to solve these challenging problems that we have, like malaria, HIV, and uh, what have you. So uh, that's just one example. And we also have alumni who are, like Terry mentioned, the, the industry initiative. Now, alumni already are having, they're being trained to have business ideas, innovative ideas that when they take back, back home and um, um, get in touch with the right people, this would actually help shape the uh, shape a, a, a nation. Uh, somebody mentioned here about the um, economy of South Africa. Yes, we know South Africa has a very thriving economy compared to some other African countries, but that is the beauty of AIMS. We, some of us have been to South Africa, we've seen what works there, and we are taking some of the ideas that we've um, received from this place, and we're taking it back home. Now, it may be, it may seem that some people are expecting answers you know, in the next year or so. But this is a process. It's a process, and AIMS has only been there for 10 years. And like you had, there have been over 200 people that will complete their PhDs. So we have a network of alumni. And this whole brainstorming is still going on. It's still going on. And all I would say is you should watch out, because these guys are very smart. We are just five of, the, five of us are just represented here, but they are over. 500 of us who have excellent ideas, right, that which they will take back home in the next couple of years, and Watch Out Africa is going to be the leader, and this Africa's problems that people are currently facing today, it is an AIMS alumni, I am very, very convinced, it's an AIMS alumni that will be the, you know, that will be the center to look, to look out, look out uh, for, and then, I'm very con the question here is, will the next Einstein be from Africa? For sure, the next Einstein is going to be from Africa. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That is all the time. Am I wrapping? Are you wrapping? Who's wrapping? Okay, I'll just, I, I will say thank you very much. Uh, um, I noticed while we were talking, I'm the only Canadian up here. Um, <laughs> And uh, for a very modest investment, we have managed to do something, we've managed to help sustain something that is uh, important to the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I run around the country this week, I noticed that some of the news that we're, that's, that's filling the newspapers doesn't, doesn't necessarily make us proud. And so <laughs> it's, it's nice to end the week here. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you very what, much. What a great afternoon. Uh, this has been inspirational. Uh, you brought, you know, the best of what we can help to build, but you are really doing it. Someone says, I think it was Thierry and a lady, this is an African initiative. Paul, you mentioned it. This has been developed, taught in Africa. This has been run by African. This is an ID that is made in order to solve problem there, but to expand to the world also.
Council, IDRC, uh, my predecessor, Royenton Manora, that is now in Waterloo at CG, uh, used to say, IDRC is there to help to build the platform. You are delivering the keynotes, and today you show this in spades. So thank you very much for all your uh, thought this afternoon. And for you, the public, that have come uh, and are numerous. You may ask yourself from time to time, what is International Development Research Center doing? You have a perfect illustration. It's about delivering impacts. You know, if you are asked what are we doing, you can tell a story over here. You know, it's about working with the leaders of today and of tomorrow. Marvelous, Richard, Felix, Nozifiwo, Martial, uh, you are showing the world here in Canada that, yes, the next Einstein will be from Africa, but more importantly, you will all be leader in your own field. Now you are, and you will become greater. Neil, uh, it's fantastic what you have been doing. Thierry, it's exceptional that you are pursuing this journey. Et puis Paul. Merci infiniment. Thank you very much for having uh, been our moderator this afternoon. And please put a story in McLean's magazine also. <laughs> <laughs>